welcome everybody to our um, February Leon seminar. Uh, that today we have um, the, the the joy and the honor to have with us uh, Professor Alexander Stramitzer of um, ETH Zurich, and he leads the Law and Economics and Business Group at the at the ETH of Zurich. And um, he's a law and economics scholar, but like uh, with no prefix because he has a completely global, not only academic record in, in Vienna and Paris with his education in economics and also in law, but also his academic activity has developed in, in Europe, in Bonn and, and in the US, both at um, Yale and ultimately becoming a full professor at UCLA. Uh, but since 2018, fortunately, we have him closer to us in Zurich. Uh, he serves at the board of the American Law and Economics um, Association. And as we can see today, he has a theoretical, but also an experimental um, perspectives on law and economics, and, and in this case, on, on judicial adjudication. And I leave the floor for you. and. Um, and he will take questions regarding the content of the paper at the end, but um, he welcomes questions to clarify eventually. Um, everybody's welcome to use the chat and the floor is yours, Alex. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mireya, for this um, uh, invitation. Um, so as Mireya uh, said, um, I welcome uh, questions, uh, clarifying questions uh, all through the talk uh, with arranged for the talk to be recorded, um, but then the discussion not to be recorded so that we can have a very uh, free and unfettered um, uh, discussion. Um, so I think it makes sense to divide questions in the manner I just uh, suggested. Um, my talk is about uh, robot judges and it is joint work with my former postdoc, Kevin Tobia, who is now a professor at Georgetown University Law Center and uh, Ben Chen, who was a former visiting fellow at uh, the Center for Law and Economics at ETH, who is now a professor at Hong Kong University. Um, to some of you uh, who have not closely followed developments in legal tech, um, our paper might sound a bit like science fiction, and to a certain extent it is, uh, but it's actually less fanciful than what you might think. Actually, uh, I'm involved, for instance, in a project with Thomson Reuters who have developed a tool to summarize legal texts, uh, which they use internally, but which in principle could be deployed at law firms um, and courts to streamline the work of associates and to streamline the work of law clerks. And uh, as you can readily see, distilling the relevant legal facts is an important function in making legal decisions. So you could easily imagine that a tool like that would be a component of what ultimately could be a Robert Clerk or a Robert Judge. Now, you also don't have to take my word for it. Um, there's also um, uh, a question that a college president asked to Chief Justice John Roberts uh, in 2017 in a recorded conversation where he says, can you foresee a day when smart machines driven with artificial intelligences will assist with courtroom fact-finding or more controversially even judicial decision-making. And the chief justice answer was, it's a day that's here. Now, if we look at um, artificially intelligent machines um, and their role in the legal system, we find that they are already deployed in various forms. So machines largely function as decision aids so far, sometimes called as Robert clerks as, a as opposed to Robert judges. Um, and uh, main applications in the US is to recommend um, uh, sentencing decisions, um, but also whether bail should be granted or not. But there are also examples where AI acts as primary decision makers um, in the United States. Um, so for instance, when welfare benefits are granted, or when, for instance, it's determined whether you're excluded from air travel because you might pose a terrorist uh, uh, threat. Um, there's also companies um, that uh, use algorithms for um, dispute resolution. 
Um, uh, so eBay uh, is, is, is a good example. So commercial arbitration is uh, done through algorithms. And then Estonia, there were press reports. I, I don't have it confirmed, but you know, I saw press reports that they have moved their small claims courts to AI adjudicated courts. Um, and then in China, um, there is lots of talk about what is called the same type case reference system. And that is basically a system where when a judge decides a case, um, the judge will get a recommendation how he should decide the case because the system actually um, sees whether there are similarly situated cases. And then the judge can still take another decision, but um, the, the judge would have to justify why he takes another decision. Uh, so you see that in principle, although there is a human in the loop, um, this is just one step removed from having a, a, a full-fledged uh, robot, robot judge. And then apparently there are cyber courts in Hangzhou, but you know my uh, Hong Kong colleague says that uh, there's some disputes about you know whether this is as far advanced as some people claim. Um, I've, I've just found uh, one, two papers talking about it, but, um, but apparently uh, it, it might be we are not yet there. But, but you see in principle, there is, uh, there's a push um, and it, it gets surprisingly close to already having a, a, a robot judge. It's certainly uh, more and more plausible from a technological point of view. Okay, so of course there are legal doctrinal concerns. Uh, would a robot judge undermine the right to fair trial? Uh, would a robot judge violate the EU regulation related to AI? Would a robot judge violate fair trial standards of the European Convention of Human Rights? Um, those are not the questions we're going to talk about today. Uh, what I'm trying to um, present you today is some ideas or some results uh, with respect to the legal ethical question. So, which, which for me is assuming that the doctrinal challenges can be met, are robot judges perceived by lay people as procedurally fair? So do defendants feel fairly hurt? Do defendants perceive decisions as legitimate? Now, of course, looking at lay people's attitudes is um, a long tradition in legal psychology. Um, so uh, Tom Tyler has pioneered that work. And mainly the reason why we might be interested in lay people's attitudes is that we know that in general, compliance is better if people perceive the law as fair. So that would be an instrumental reason why we care about lay people's attitudes towards law. Um, and second, we might care about it because we think it's relevant in itself. Um, so for instance, Ray and Solo Niedermann, they have a paper where they say that it is a separate procedural harm if a subject to an adjudication doesn't consider the process as fair or legitimate. Um, so you see that either we have this instrumental po uh, point of view that we say we care about compliance and therefore we care about whether lay people think a procedure is fair, or we think that in itself, it's important that people uh, consider the process as fair because otherwise they suffer a procedural harm. And so the question that we are going to ask in this paper is, would people in a legal community consider a robot judge as procedurally fair? And by the way, there's a very nice paper, uh, working paper um, uh, out there, which appeared after we had finished our first draft, which um, also looks at hybrid decision systems where you have the robot clerk situation. But we are looking at these polar cases. We're, we're looking at this polar case, uh, a robot judge versus a human judge. So there's not, this otherwise practically very important third option of, of a combination of, 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 of the two. Um, okay, so let me now um, 
share with you some of the hypotheses that we had as we went into this project. So first of all, we thought that maybe comparative levels of perceived fairness, so we're talking about perceived fairness of the human judge versus perceived fairness of the robot judge, that this could be context specific. So one of our intuitions was that probably people don't care as much about being judged by an AI judge, uh, by an AI judge if it is a low stake case, like a traffic ticket or something like that, or a small commercial arbitration case where let's say you buy something from a site and then it's a question of whether the warranty conditions are fulfilled, uh, whether the, the good is defective and it's, you know, we are talking about 100 euros or something like that. Then, then of course, it could be very different. You might care about speed of the decision. Um, you might care about also um, the cost of the decision that's ultimately put on you uh, as, a, as a consumer. Whereas if we're talking about criminal sentencing, where we're talking about uh, life in prison or not life in press, a prison, there may be, you know, we, we might feel not as comfortable um, if we have a, a, a robot judge as opposed to a human judge. I mean, that is something that we thought going into this project might be a very plausible idea. Um, second, we thought that if it is about objective facts as opposed to um, states of mind like guilt, what you would have to determine in criminal sentencing, this might also be something where uh, you like the robot judge comparatively more if it is about objective facts. So if we have to determine whether there's as much on, on the lens of a camera that you bought, that's an objective thing that you can determine, um, also, maybe um, reoffense risk and bail decisions. It's not just. It's not as objective as the other one, but it 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 still is closer to objective than subjective, probably. But then, if we're going to talk about guilt, um, it is it's completely clear this is very subjective, and and we might want to, you know, harness this human ability of empathy of understanding in order to uh, to feel comfortable. Um, that the process is, um, is, is fair. So here the first um, idea would have been, um, or the first hypothesis was that um, AI judges are comparatively better. If we are talking about, if, 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 if the case turns on objective facts and if the case is about low stakes. So that would be our first hypothesis coming into this project. Second hypothesis uh, was can, uh, it, it could be that um, that a hearing in front of an AI judge is just meaningless. Yeah? So imagine, I mean, there's evidence that people like to have a hearing where they can actually explain their point of view. And you could you could think, and that was certainly our our prior going into this project, that talking to a computer, having a hearing in front of a computer, is not something that people would feel comfortable with. And that there's a distinct human advantage um, in a setting where there is a hearing. And so we thought that probably in those areas of, uh, or with those procedures where there is no hearing, like usually we don't have a hearing if you get a traffic fine, for instance, um, then we wouldn't care so much. And maybe the difference between AI and human judge would be uh, would be lower. But if there's a hearing, a meaningful hearing, then um, the human judge would be uh, preferred. So um, that's another hypothesis that we had uh, going into the project. Okay, third hypothesis that we had going into the project is uh, there's lots of discussion about how interpretable a decision is. And um, many people have this intuition that we are used to human decision-making. And although if you think about it, human decision-making is often not very interpretable. It's very difficult really to, um, to, to, to understand what really went through the head of the judge when he or she reached the decision. Um, we are so used to it that we that we care about interpretability less when we are talking about 
a human judge. In some way, we assume we can interpret this. We have this fiction that we can interpret the decision of a human person, but we care about interpretability um, when um, there is um, a machine um, making the decision. And so this would translate into the hypothesis that the relative fairness um, is more in favor of the machine um, if there is uh, uh, basically a very transparent, uh, a very interpretable uh, decision that, uh, that we are talking about, where it's basically some sort of decision tree um, where, where it's possible in exposed to really, um, to really see what steps the machine went through as opposed to a black box, which is difficult to understand, like in a neural network or something like that. Okay, so um, these were our hypotheses going into this project. Now, um, I'm going to present to you um, the results from two experiments that we did in order to test this, and um, also some, some other things that I will talk um, uh, about in the course of the talk. Um, this was two experiments with 6,000 uh, US adults. Um, and we experimentally varied the decision maker. So do we have a human judge or an AI judge? We vary the scenario. Do we have a bail scenario, a sentencing, or a commercial arbitration scenario? You see, that's basically uh, what we do. Um, the, the commercial arbitration um, example would be uh, low stake and objective facts and bail uh, and sentencing would basically be very high stake um, and very subjective and bail is somewhere in between so we thought that with these with these scenarios we were able to get at this hy hypothesis that procedural fairness perceptions might be context dependent um, and then um, we varied whether there is a hearing or not and whether the judge's decision is interpretable or not. And I, I should have mentioned to those of you, I, I don't know who of you has run studies with vignettes. Basically, this is a vignette study where we, um, where we describe certain scenarios to people. And then we, um, our, our treatments is that, you know, this description varies. And, and then we see how the experimental variation that we are using is affecting basically the, the result and the measures of perceived fairness that our participants um, indicate. Okay, so let me now um, give you a short preview of our results before I go into um, the argument. Um, so first, we find that there is a perceived a human AI fairness gap. So proceedings with human judges are seen as fair. This is what I think most people would, um, would expect. So that's not very surprising. But we uncover a way to reduce the fairness gap, which we call algorithm offsetting. Um, and what we, what we find also still quite plausible is interpretability and hearings increase fairness ratings. So people like a procedure more if there's a hearing, they like it more if the decision by the judge is um, interpretable. But, and this is the first kind of surprising result, we find it both for human and AI judges. So our hypothesized uh, interaction is not something that we find. So it doesn't seem to be that our participants feel that a hearing in front of an AI judge is meaningless. It doesn't seem that our participants feel that um, interpretability only matters for the machine and not for the human. So these hypothesized interaction effects we don't find. And of course, now uh, a null finding is not, is, 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 is not a finding of um, kind of, of, of the opposite, but you will see that's also the reason why we have two experiments. Uh, we, 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 actually, um, we actually find the, the 
we, we see that the non-interaction effect, uh, that the interaction effect is not significant. And then we actually simulate what based on our data we would need as a sample size to find that these interaction terms would be significant. We rerun the experiment and we see that the interaction uh, terms are still not significant and even uh, the coefficients become smaller. So that, that's basically um, uh, uh, the core of the argument here. But um, so what I, what I want to defend as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a result or as a finding of this paper is that surprisingly, we find that interpretability and hearing uh, matters for both humans and AI judges. So increasing an AI judge's interpretability or adding a hearing opportunity can actually reduce the fairness gap. Uh, think about a situation where, for instance, for cost reasons, we can't do a hearing in front of a human judge. Then we would have a human judge without a hearing compared to an AI judge with a hearing. And people care about hearings, even if it is in front of an AI judge. And so you see that there's the, this potential to, to, to actually offset that, this, this, this fairness gap. Same with interpretability. It seems that people care about interpretability also with human judges. Now imagine with a situation where it's quite difficult to interpret what a human decided, but actually the machine allows us to, um, to achieve a higher degree of interpretability. For instance, you could do these counterfactual inquiries where the machine would probably tell you what would have been different if we had changed um, the input, which some people think is one definition of interpretability of a decision. And, and you can see that this is pretty easy with a machine, but pretty difficult with a, with a human judge. And, and so it could be that there's even an advantage in terms of interpretability. And this advantage of interpretability can be used in order to reduce this fairness gap. And then third, and this is not a result from the experimental treatment, but um, a result from a mediation analysis, which is, of course, uh, a little bit more problematic in terms of determining causality than, um, than if we look at experimental treatments. But um, we also have suggestive evidence that the human AI advantage, so this fairness gap, is more related to heart as opposed to distinctively human soft factors. So I will argue a little bit later that we that, that it seems that most people who value the human judge more than the AI judge do so because they think that the human judge is more thorough, is more comprehensive, as opposed to thinking that the human judge is, I mean, is, it, so what's, what's important is not so much that um, the feeling of being heard, the feeling of being understood, these distinctively human things that I thought would, would be important, but they didn't really figure very importantly in, in the mediation analysis. And so you can, in principle, assume uh, or imagine that we can further close the fairness gap or even come to a situation where um, the robot judge is considered to be superior compared to the human judge in the domain of cases where we can show through hard facts that maybe the machine achieves higher accuracy or higher comprehensiveness. Um, so so that, that would be another potential avenue to reduce this fairness gap. Okay, so this is the preview of the results. Let's now um, let's now see whether I can convince you that they are actually true um, or that, that actually our study points towards them. Okay, so here's the design of the first study. You see, it's a, it's a really big study. It's a three by two by two by two design. So we have 24 um, treatments um, and uh, it's a between subject design. So each subject is only exposed to one of these um, particular uh, cells. Um, and I would like to give you a little bit of a glimpse into the wording of the, of the vignettes that we used. So for instance, here you have a scenario um, that deals with arbitration. So here it says, 
The dispute between the parties centered around one, whether there was a smudge mark on the camera and two, whether the photographs were discolored. And um, the stake is 2,500. So you see low stake and the case turns on objective facts. Then um, we have the pre-trial bail uh, scenario. And there it says, there are two reasons that a court might decide to keep John in custody in this context. Flight risk, the risk that John would flee before his trial, and further offenses risk, the risk that John might commit further criminal offenses before his trial. Um, here, the stake, the stake is, of course, jail time between committal uh, or arrest and, and trial. Uh, so you see the stake is already much higher. Um, and you see that, uh, but it's still quite objective, although less so than a smudge mark on a lens. And then we have the third scenario, which is custodial sentencing. Um, so here it says the sentencing factor include A, the nature of the crime, the character and history of the defendant, such as whether John has a criminal history, and whether John was under great personal stress or duress when committing the crime. And here the stake of determining this is, is 10 years in prison. So high stake. And when you look at the character, whether somebody was under great personal stress, that's things which are quite subjective. I mean, it's very difficult to um, probably objectively uh, come to an answer um, uh, when you want to determine character or whether somebody was under stress. Good. Um, now, in all these scenarios, we told our participants that the decision went against John. Okay. And now, um, let me introduce you to the human versus algorithmic judge treatment. Um, so um, uh, here we are uh, in, a, in the bail setting with a human judge. And then it's a, it, here it says, in the state where John was arrested and charged, bail decisions are made by a judge. These judges are very experienced and can predict flight and further offenses risk to a very high degree of accuracy. Among other things, the judge already has information about John's background, his previous convictions, and potential extenuating circumstances, if any. Okay, now the same setting with the AI um, treatment, the, the robot judge, in the state where John was arrested and charged, bail decisions are made by an algorithm. This algorithm employs advanced statistical machine learning techniques and can predict flight and you see everything else is the same. So I, I highlighted basically the language that is different. So that would be the example of a, of a, of a, of a treatment. Um, this is how we implemented the AI judge and, and, and the human judge. Um, then how did we implement hearing versus no hearing? So here you have a setting where we have arbitration with an AI judge and a hearing, and it says, before an algorithm makes a decision, sometimes there is an arbitration hearing, but sometimes there is not. In John's case, there is an arbitration hearing. John has an opportunity to present his case in person. The hearing allows John to explain why the camera was damaged and therefore should be refunded by speaking to a computer that transcribes his speech for consideration by the algorithm. Through this hearing, the algorithm is able to evaluate John's credibility and emotions. And here you have now um, the same for the human. Um, before an arbitrator makes a decision, sometimes there's an arbitration hearing and so on and so on. And then it says, through this hearing, the arbitrator would have been able to evaluate John's credibility and emotions. Okay, so again, I've, uh, I've highlighted the question that differs between the two treatments. Now, uh, interpretable, ver interpretable versus not interpretable. So here we have the scenario with arbitration and um, uh, a situation where it's interpretable. It says, uh, while the, um, yeah, the arbitrator's reasoning is rigorous, um, it is also easy to understand. All factors were considered using a flow chart that asks at each stage whether a particular criteria is satisfied. And now you would have arbitration non-interpretable. Uh, the decision maker's reasoning is rigorous. It's not easy to understand. 
all factors were considered, but given the complex nature of the decision-making process, it's not possible to describe in simple terms how the decision made, uh, how the decision was produced. And then it goes on. Moreover, in the case of the interpretability of the high interpret interpretability, moreover, it would be possible for someone else to replicate the decision maker's reasoning to see how a change in any of his factors impacts the sentencing decision. So this is this definition of interpretability. Um, I think it's due to Sandra Wachte um, uh, uh, on that, that interpretability means that you can see how a counterfactual in which, I mean, what the consequence of a counterfactual would be. Yeah? And, um, and then of course, we, um, we don't have this, 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 extra, um, this extra part uh, when we have the non-interpretable uh, scenario, okay? So this is, this is to introduce you to the way how we did our manipulations in the experiment. Now, um, is, are there any questions with regard to that? Because now I'm jumping into, into the results. Okay, so let me then go to the results. So first thing, we document this human AI fairness gap. So you see that on average, a human decision maker is considered as more fair than an AI decision maker. And that um, is a highly significant uh, result. Uh, we use two-sided t-tests um, as we uh, pre-registered. And uh, you see that um, uh, we find this as well at well below uh, uh, even one point uh, one uh, percent um, uh, significance. Then second, um, also not surprising for those who look at procedural fairness papers, we find that um, both the hearing and the interpretability matters and that we can also find um, uh, using two-sided t-tests um, as we pre-registered. However, if we have a full regression and we, um, we, we include the interaction terms and so on, um, actually the uh, coefficient for interpretability goes into, into is, is positive, so it, it seems from the direction goes in the way we hypothesize, but um, controlling for all of this, um, we lose significance. Huh? So that's that's the first thing to see. So what you see in this regression table is basically you have, you, 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 you see that if you have an algorithmic decision maker, procedural fairness goes down, okay? So you have the negative coefficient here. Um, and you see that if we introduce a hearing, procedural fairness, perceived procedural fairness goes up. And then you see here's the interaction term. And the interaction term is, we, we see that, I mean, th th this is basically this idea, is a hearing in front of an AI judge meaningless? And if that is the case, we would assume a very high negative coefficient here. Now we see that the coefficient is negative as we had hypothesized. So it seems that we care less about a hearing if it is a machine than if it is a in front of a human. But then we see that this, um, that this coefficient is not significant. It's not statistically significant. The same um, if we look at um, interpretability, here we would assume that we care more about interpretability if it is an AI decision maker, and we indeed find a positive coefficient, but again, we don't have significance. So actually, given our, given our hypotheses that I, that, that I listed to you, um, you know, we thought, you know, maybe there's still hope, you know, we, 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 we were not able to, to, to get the results that we hypothesized, but maybe, um, maybe our sample size was not big enough. Now, um, of course, it would now be very bad science if you just kind of kept increasing the sample size until you get your result. So what we did is we didn't just 
keeping, we, we didn't just increase the sample size, we, we used, we, we said, let's treat this as a pilot and let's simulate what sample size we need in order to, uh, to conclude on the basis of similar data that we have an interaction effect that goes in the hypothesized direction. And we, um, we saw that 5,000 people were what we needed in order to have a 75 to 80% power to detect the interaction effect. So that's what we did. Um, and given that we saw that the context didn't really matter in the way how we had hypothesized, we did not look at the context anymore to have more people per cell. Uh, so we only varied human algorithm interpretable, not interpretable hearing, no hearing. So it was a two by two by two uh, between subject design. And here's what we find. So first of all, um, again, we find that hearing and interpretability increases perceptions of procedural fairness. If you now look at the regression table, what you see is, again, the decision maker matter. So this is the human AI fairness gap. We like human decision makers more. Here we see hearings matter. We like procedures with a hearing. It's highly significant. Interpretability matters. You see, we like interpretability and it's this time highly significant. And now interestingly, what you see is um, not only don't we have significance of the interaction term, the coefficient even becomes um, uh, becomes smaller, and in this case, even turns in turn, turns negative. Although we had assumed it would be positive, yeah? or we had hypothesized it would be positive. Okay, so um, the next um, the next question is uh, so just just from this we can conclude that it seems that hearing, that for our people, hearing and interpretab interpretability mattered for both human and, um, and AI judges. And the hypothesis that it mattered differently for the two, that it would be meaningless for to, to have a hearing in front of a machine or that we care more about interpretability in front of the machine, that was basically not what we found. Okay, so next question is, um, what drives this fairness gap? Could it be these hard factors, decision was, decisions perceived accuracy, decisions perceived thoroughness and comprehensiveness, soft factors like perceived understanding of the defendant's position, perceived feeling that the defendant's voice had been heard. So we, besides fairness rankings, we are also asking for those, um, for those things. And what we find from this mediation analysis is that 29% of the difference between the perceived fairness between the human and the AI was accounted for by people who worried about accuracy. They thought that, that the machine was less accurate than the human. Um, then 27% uh, of the difference was explained by different, um, different assumptions about thoroughness and comprehensiveness. And just 12% and 2% respectively for understanding the defendant's position and for the feeling that the defendant had a voice. So we felt that those, or, or that's the way how we, that, that's the reason why we constructed it like that or where we asked those questions. We felt that the first two were more hard facts uh, or more questions concerned with hard facts. The, sec the, the second set of questions was more concerned with inimitable, distinctively human uh, qualities like being able to understand being kind of giving this feeling to the defendant that that um, um, uh, he or she had a voice um, and so what we can conclude from this is that the human AI advantage at least in our data doesn't seem to be driven by distinctively human soft factors okay so what are the implications first the human AI fairness gap is a challenge for robot judges. Um, the objection is ground in perceived fairness. And that, of course, goes beyond 
doctrinal objections. So even if we think the doctrinal objections can be solved, then we say there is still a perception in people that human judges are considered procedurally more fair. So that's the first result. Second, um, perceived fairness is influenced by hearing and interpretability. And surprisingly, um, adding a hearing matters both for human and AI judges. So adding a hearing does not provide a larger benefit in a human-led proceeding compared to an AI one. And surprisingly, improving interpretability does not matter more in an AI-led proceeding compared to a human one. So that suggests that people are amenable to what we call algorithm, uh, algorithm offset, uh, offsetting. So creating an AI judge that is more interpretable than a human judge would narrow the fairness gap. Having a hearing in front of an AI judge could further narrow the fairness gap. That is particularly relevant in situations where resource constraints prevent hearings in front of a human judge. And we find that lay people don't consider an AI judge as less fair if the AI judge's decision is interpretable, while the human judge's decision is not, which I think is often quite realistic. And if there is a hearing in front of the AI judge, but not in front of the human judge, which I also think is sometimes realistic. I mean, we're talking about when we're talking about immigration hearings, I hear that people spend one minute in front of a judge or 30 seconds in front of a judge. That's not what people probably consider a meaningful hearing. And then finally, a mediation analysis suggests that the human AI advantage is more related to the decision's accuracy and comprehensiveness rather than to distinctively human factors like understanding of the defendant's position or feeling that the defendant had a voice. And that suggests that hard information about superior accuracy by algorithms in certain domains, I'm not claiming that algorithms are in general more accurate, but in certain domains where we have hard information about superior accuracy, this would also have further potential to narrow the fairness gap. So it's likely that, for instance, AI achieves superior accuracy compared to human decision makers in some domains. And um, especially if there's a ground truth, there's hard information about that. And so our results suggest that if you can actually provide this hard information to people, they might actually change their, um, their, their view about uh, what is comparatively more fair. Okay, so what are the conclusions? Uh, I think we tell a nuanced story concerning perceptions of robot judges. Uh, human judges are generally favored as more procedurally fair, but they are not perceived to have inimitable procedural fairness advantages. And in some circumstances, people see having your day in human court as no fairer than having your day in robot court. And I might even add, it's even imaginable that um, under the right circumstances, certain procedures would actually be considered more fair in front of the robot judge than in front of the human judge. We didn't observe that in any of the treatments of our experiment, but especially if we take this idea of uh, providing this hard information to convince people that maybe their perceptions about relative accuracy and relative comprehensiveness are not grounded in reality, it's very, um, it's, it's, it's very plausible that they would consider some procedures in front of the robot judge as more fair. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention.